First then, we are the salt of the earth, so we mustn't lose our saltiness. And secondly, we are the light of the world, so we must let our light shine. Lord, we praise you for this treasure that we have from you, your all-surpassing power at work in and through us. And we ask that you will help us to learn more about that from your word, by your spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. Do take a seat. Celebrations take all kinds of different forms, don't they? I never expected in my lifetime to be leaping out of my seat, arms aloft with a shout of joy, celebrating England winning a penalty shootout. <laughs> and as for yesterday afternoon, I didn't hear the result actually. What, was, what happened? Does anyone know? Let's, let's just say, I am ready. <laughs> All that God has done for us in Christ, and we've been hearing uh, in a beautiful way, just a little taste about that this evening. All that God has done for us in Christ is cause for great celebration. All that he has done by his spirit in and through us so far is cause for massive joy, continuous joy, and we so easily lose sight of that. And the very best possible way to celebrate is to listen to God's word, to listen to God himself speaking to us, and to commit ourselves afresh to living out what he says to us, to get on with doing it by the power of his spirit. So that is what we're going to do. And salt and light is my title. We are on uh, to this next section of this extraordinary Sermon on the Mount that Jesus preached to the crowds that surged around him and that continues to ring around the world, profoundly challenging hearts and minds and changing lives, our own included. So we're looking at Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 to 16. If you're not there yet, do have that open in front of you. It's page 810 in the Bibles. And now, just by way of introduction, and to put our passage in context so we can understand it better, let me just make four introductory points. First of all, this comes hard on the heels of Jesus calling the first disciples. Chapter 4, verse 19, just turn over the page and have a look at that, that says this, and Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. So this is about the way of life of disciples of Jesus. Secondly, this is about the way of life that flows from repentance, faith, and the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Just look back up another couple of verses to chapter 4, verse 17, for repentance. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 4.19 that we just looked at is uh, about those first disciples leaving everything to follow Jesus. And that really is a picture of what faith is all about. And with regard to the empowering of the Spirit, look a little bit further back up to what John the Baptist says in chapter 3, verse 11, about Jesus. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So what Jesus describes in the Sermon on the Mount in general, and in chapter 5, verses 13 to 16 in particular, is a supernatural way of life. Without that supernatural transforming and empowering, we cannot begin to do it. It is all about having faith in Jesus and following Jesus and being full of Jesus. 
Our little back garden is chock-a-block with glorious tubs of flowers now, thanks to Vivian. And uh, they are very thirsty, especially at the moment, uh, with all this wonderful weather that we're enjoying. So I go out in the back garden, and I take hold of our hose, and I go all the way around the garden from tub to tub. But that would be absolutely useless if I did not first turn on the tap. And all that gushing, life-giving, growth-producing water does not come from me. It comes from those high-pressure mains. And so it is with us if we're going to make a life-giving difference in the world. We have to be connected to the water supply with the tap wide open. We have to be connected to the mains electricity with the switch on. We have to be united to Jesus with a living faith so that his power flows through us to the world. Thirdly, Jesus' teaching about being salt and light is in the context of living as joyful, celebrating, persecuted peacemakers in Jesus' name. Look at what comes just before our passage in 5, 11, and 12. Jesus says, Blessed are you, when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. When I was a boy, I would very often fall over, and uh, because I was out playing in my shorts, I would get painful grazes on my knees and I would run back to my mum and out would come the TCP antiseptic. I hated that bottle. On it would go and boy, would it sting. It hurt me and I would shriek. But it was for my good. And the world might shriek rather more violently in reaction to the sting of the saltiness of distinctive Christian witness but it is doing the world good, even if it doesn't recognize it. And fourthly, note that Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. It's not something that we aspire to or that we grow into. It is who we are in Christ, as those who trust in him, as those who are following him. We can hide it. We can degrade it, but we are it. Our 10-month-old grandson, Ezra, has done virtually nothing in life so far, uh, as far as I can see, except B. But I look into those bright blue, curious eyes of his, and what do I see? I see a little man, a fully-fledged human being, a person. He doesn't have to work at it, being a person. He's not growing into being a person. He is a person. He, of course, has much growing to do, much learning to do. But he doesn't have to learn to be human. That's who he is. Salt and light in the world is what we are in Christ. So I have the two obvious points from these verses. The tricky bit really is living them. First, then, we are the salt of the earth, so we mustn't lose our saltiness. And secondly, we are the light of the world, so we must let our light shine. So let's take each of those in turn. First of all, we are the salt of the earth, so we mustn't lose our saltiness. This is verse 13. Just take a look at that. Jesus is speaking to his disciples, and he says, You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Now, what does that mean? The key idea is that salt is distinctive. Its power lies in its difference. And the same is true of the disciple of Jesus. And, of course, salt works in two ways. First of all, salt works on taste. It improves the taste and the flavor of things. 
the Beatitudes in chapter 5, verses 1 to 11, are all about the blessing that true disciples experience. But we are blessed in order to be a blessing. Even if we are hated, we make things better for those who are around us. That's not down to us. It's because we are in contact with Jesus. I do like salt on my food. The cooks in my family keep telling me that I should taste the food first before I start grinding the rock salt all over it because they've gone to great trouble to season it just exactly right. I ignore them and just put the salt on anyway. Why? Because it improves the meal. As I see it, the more salt, the better the flavor. Christians are the salt of the earth. Christ-connected people make the world a better place. Secondly, salt works as a preservative. It prevents decay and destruction. Now, we have to imagine a world without fridges and freezers, and also in a hot climate. Salt prevents things getting worse. And you might ask the question, how could salt lose its saltiness? Well, as Don Carson, the Bible teacher, puts it, most salt in the ancient world derived from salt marshes or the like, rather than by evaporation of salt water, and therefore contain many impurities. The actual salt, being more soluble than the impurities, could be leached out, leaving a residue so dilute it was of little worth. This summer I'm enjoying rereading some of the brilliant Hornblower books by C.S. Forrester about life in the Royal Navy at the time of the Napoleonic Wars 200 years ago that I first read as a boy. And part of the staple diet for all those poor press-ganged sailors was meat preserved by large quantities of salt. Along with the weevil-filled biscuits, they would get salt beef and salt pork and the salt kept the meat edible and nutritious through those long months away at sea. We don't use salt as a preservative much nowadays. We have fridges and freezers. The other day I saw a TV documentary that showed, with images that were really rather too graphic for my own taste, uh, the bacteria that is present in all food and which will multiply and rot the food given half a chance. And freezing the food prevents the bacteria from multiplying and so stops the rot. We are the salt of the earth. Nowadays you could say we are the fridges and freezers of the earth, stopping the rot. So salt both improves and preserves. It's good stuff. That is what we are called to be like. Why must we be like this? In order to be useful to Jesus. And out of love for a hurting and decaying world. That same love that led Jesus to lay down his life. How then should we be like this? Well, first of all, we should taste of Jesus, so to speak. It's what it means to be salty. It's what it means for our speaking to be seasoned with salt, as the Apostle Paul puts it in Colossians chapter 4, verse 6. What with all this unaccustomed sunshine that we're enjoying we're well and truly in the barbecue season, and uh, long may it last, and I do really like a tasty piece of chicken marinated in a delicious barbecue sauce. And if the chicken is really going to take on the flavor of the sauce deep down, it has to be marinated for a good long time. The sauce maybe even needs to be rubbed in vigorously. And then the sauce and the chicken become one and cook it on some good smoky flames and you're away. And if I can say this reverently, we have to be marinated in the spirit of Jesus, soaked in him for a long time, continuously in fact, and then we will taste of him. And when the world takes a bite of us, we need to taste of Jesus. And secondly, we should spread out all over the world. Rebecca Manley Pippert's classic book on personal evangelism has the great title, Out of the Salt Shaker. It's when we are spread around that we make an impact. And the way it is with salt is that a small amount relative to the whole, well spread, has a large impact. I wonder if you feel isolated as a Christian in the particular world that God has put you into. Do you feel insignificant in your isolation? It is not so.
I enjoy watching the Antiques Roadshow late on a Sunday evening, and the other week they were at a fabulous old manor house, and it had a moat all around it with a working drawbridge at the main entrance. Pull up the drawbridge, and you can keep safe, and you can keep everyone else out. And some are arguing at the moment that in a world that's increasingly hostile to Christian faith, that's what the church needs to do. Some describe it as a Benedict option with reference to the early monastic communities in the Dark Ages. Now, what is true is that our churches need to be very strong and very supportive, countercultural Christian communities in which we can learn to love one another and love God together as disciples of Jesus. But we must not pull up the drawbridge. We are to spread out all over the world. We are the salt of the earth. However salty we may be, if we're not spread everywhere, we are useless. We are the salt of the earth. We must not compromise and conform to the world of which, uh, where God has placed us. We mustn't lose our saltiness. We must not withdraw. That's the first thing. Then secondly, we are the light of the world, so we must let our light shine. This is verses 14 to 16. Jesus says, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. What does that mean? Well, just as we have to imagine a world without fridges and freezers, in the same way we have to imagine a world without, ele without electric light. We have just up the road from here at Cragside in Northumberland the very first domestic home in the whole wide world to be lit by electric light. But that was really a very short time ago that happened. Throw your mind back to a world of candles and oil lamps. What does such light do? First, light enables people, otherwise in the dark, to see reality. Jesus is the truth. He is the reality. People need to see Jesus through us. Been distressing publicity recently about the number of suicides of young men and women away from home as students at university. If possible, it's even more distressing to hear that suicide rates among students are, if anything, somewhat lower than in other parts of the population. And suicide is the tip of the iceberg of the misery that blights our society. It is dark out there. Those who are lost in the darkness desperately need the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world. He shines through his people. Our calling is to show the lost the way to hope and peace through Jesus. So first of all, light enables people otherwise in the dark to see reality in Jesus. Secondly, light enables people otherwise lost to find their way around. The other day Vivian had abandoned me to fend for myself, so I did what I usually do when she does that, and I have to cook my own food, and I headed off to the supermarket to buy a ready meal. And as I was browsing the chicken tikka masalas with pilau rice, which is what I usually end up with, I noticed along the aisle a young man standing there discussing the ingredients in various items on the shelves and choosing what to buy. Nothing remarkable in that, you might think, except that he was obviously completely blind. His guide dog was the first giveaway to that. How did he know where to go? How did he know what he was looking at and what was on the labels? Well, he was holding the elbow of a young woman in the outfit of the staff of the supermarket. And he was being guided around the store by her and using her eyes, as it were, to read the labels on the food. Without her, he couldn't see where he was going. He couldn't read what he was looking at. 
We are the light of the world. Our calling is to enable otherwise lost people to find their way. Why must we be like this? First, because we, the church, are this light. This is what we are for. We are in Christ. Jesus is the light of the world. That's what he said about himself, of course. John chapter 8, verse 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And now that we are in Christ by his Spirit, and Jesus is in heaven at the right hand of the Father, we, his people, filled with his light, are the light of the world on the earth. Secondly, we must be the light of the world for the praise and glory of God the Father and of his Son. Verse 16, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good, good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So how should we be the light of the world? Well, first of all, don't keep quiet. Like a city on a hill, like Jesus on top of that mount teaching the crowds of his disciples, we are to tell what we found and what we know about him. Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 to 16, the Apostle Paul says, Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God, without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life. Don't keep quiet. And then secondly, do good. We might even be reviled and persecuted for our pains, but we are to stick at it. Someone has put it, the good word without the good walk is of no avail. Don Carson, in his exposition of the Sermon on the Mount, gives a reminder that at the time of the evangelical revival and following it, I quote, the faithful and divinely empowered proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ so transformed men and women that they, t they in turn became the light of the world. Prison reform, medical care, trade unions, control of perverted and perverting liquor trade, abolition of slavery, abolition of child labor, establishment of orphanages, reform of the penal code. In all these areas, the followers of Jesus spearheaded the drive for righteousness. May the same be said of our generation by the grace of God. One small lamp can throw light into a far larger space. Do you feel insignificant? It is not so. So we must let our light shine. Don't hide it. Don't withdraw from the world. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, flight into the invisible is a denial of the call. A community of Jesus which seeks to hide itself has ceased to follow him. Let your light shine. What a privilege However hard the road, what a cause for celebration this is. What a joy to know Jesus and to have his light within us. What a privilege to be useful to him. It is sheer grace that he should use us and make our lives purposeful. What a privilege it is to be a blessing to others. Let's bow our heads to pray. Our Heavenly Father, we praise you for this extraordinary privilege and responsibility that you've given us by grace, that we are the salt of the earth, we are the light of your world. Help us, we pray, Lord, more and more to be and to live out what we are, that your name will be glorified as the world sees Jesus in us. And in his name we ask it. Amen.